So not that long ago, I realized that I hadn't done a Q&A video in quite a while. I think it's been at least two years. And so I put out the call on social media, on my YouTube channel, everywhere just to say, send me your questions. I'll pick some and I'll give you some answers. Well, today's that day. So let's jump into it. I've got some time here. I have some pizza dough rising for a video I'm gonna be doing. So let's get to it. I started making rubs without salt and salting separately. Have you ever done this or considered doing this? Yeah, you know, actually, I've done quite a few rubs with low salt or no salt at all. And one of the reasons I did that is my late brother-in-law had a medical condition where he really had to cut back on salt. And we, you know, adjusted the things we would do when we were making brisket. Sometimes I would do half a brisket with a low or no salt rub and the other half with a regular rub. And also, one of the things I found is that there's a really great seasoning blend out there from Trader Joe's called 21 Seasoning Salute. There's no salt in it, if I remember correctly, and it tastes fantastic, so I would use that a lot of times. So yeah, I've done low or no salt rubs many times. What's the best way to set up and light the slow and sear for longer barbecue cooks, butts, ribs, things like that? Now, there are some directions on the SNS Girls website on how to set up the slow and sear and light it and get it going, and I alter from those slightly. First thing I do is I will usually put a pile of charcoal in the one corner and get like every other bit of charcoal off to the side. And that pile of charcoal is fairly small. Sometimes it's only six, seven, or eight briquettes. Personally, I'll use a torch to light those, but I've also used fire starters before or put lit coals in there and I let those get going, and then I just push the rest of the charcoal onto those, and we're off to the races once that gets sort of going and you get some good smoke. But basically, I try not to light too much charcoal too fast. Which films did you work on? Well, if you're not familiar with this, and I think I talked about this in previous Q&A videos, is, you know, my day job for over 25 years, and I'm not completely done with it, but this is my main gig now, but that day job was as a writer. I've written, I'm trying to think of how many novels that have been published, uh, over 10, uh, probably, actually probably closer to 15. In terms of film, I transitioned and worked in the film industry for probably 15 or 16 years. I had a movie made out of one of my books. That movie is called Mercury Rising, starring Bruce Willis. The book was Simple Simon. Uh, I had a movie starring Nicolas Cage that came out called Knowing. I wrote the original screenplay for that. I've worked on other movies and not had credit. That's just the way it works in Hollywood. You don't always get credit for the movies you work on. I worked on the remake of The Eye starring Jessica Alba. I worked on the remake of The Day the Earth Stood Still starring Keanu Reeves. There's a lot of things I've worked on, a lot of scripts I've worked on that'll never see the light of day. That's just the way it is. But I'll put a link to my books and movies down in the video description if you want to check them out. And yeah, I still write a little bit and I do stuff under pseudonym. So yeah, it's fun. If you could have only one accessory for your kettle for creating zones, which would it be? Weber baskets, Vortex, SNS, or Mallory firewall? Well, I think the key there is you said creating zones. And honestly, for me, and this is after having this, I think for over a year now after I purchased it, the Mallory firewall. It just works great, allows that adjustability in zones. Uh, you can get it really close to the side to create almost that slow and sear effect or dead center or any way you want, really. It's super heavy steel, so what it does is it absorbs heat. It acts like a heat sink. It just really helps maintain temperature in the kettle when you're using it. Now, with that said, if you are talking about creating zones for a long cook, then hands down the slow and sear. I've had the slow and sear going for over eight hours on one load of charcoal before, and it works great for that. But if you're talking about creating zones, I like the Mallory Firewall. What's your all-time favorite grill? And if you could only have one, what would it be? Well, it would be the Weber kettle. Now, there are cookers that I think do a better job. I did a video on the SNS grills, and I really think the SNS grills kettle has a lot of things that the Weber kettle should have, but sort of for nostalgia's sake, and because I really know how to use it, and I just, I love it, Weber kettle. I have two 22-inch Weber grills, one with cast iron grate and the other with factory grate. I notice when I smoke over the cast iron grate, the temps seem to hold better and are more manageable versus a factory grate. Have you noticed similar results? Yes, in my Weber kettle that has the Mallory cast iron grate living in that, which is the performer, the Weber kettle performer, yeah, 
It's a heat sink. It holds on to heat. So if you take that lid off for any reason and you need to do something there with the meat, then you put the lid back on. I find that the temperature recovers more quickly because all that stored heat is being released. So it just helps maintain a more even temperature. That's been my experience at least. So I don't think it's strange that you're noticing that at all. Most of the factory grates that you get are pretty thin metal. They're not gonna hold as much heat as a solid cast iron grate once it is heated up. I just got a 22 inch Weber kettle. Love cooking on it. With you using a kettle, what charcoal are you finding works best? Now, 98% of the time probably, I use Kingsford briquettes, just the regular blue bag ones. I have been asked many times, why don't you use lump? Well, I use lump on occasion when I'm doing direct grilling, but one of the things about lump that I've found is it burns not consistently. You have multiple piece sizes in there. Some are gonna burn hotter, some are gonna burn not as hot. Briquettes are roughly the same size and they're gonna burn at a uniform rate. That's been my experience. And especially when I'm doing longer cooks, low and slow, where charcoal is the main fuel source, I like to have that more predictable burn rate. That's just how I've gotten used to it. Now, I know people who use lump in the slow and sear and doing long cooks and they do fine. Really, you gotta find what works best for you. This is not about one right answer. Uh, it works best for me to use briquettes and I've always found just the regular kinks for blue bag briquettes work great. I've tried all the other kinds, I think, of briquettes from different manufacturers, expensive, not expensive, and I honestly haven't noticed much difference. So personally, I don't pay a ton of money for charcoal when I can get it. If I get the Kingsford Blue on special, I'm happy. What is one of your more memorable cooking catastrophes and how did you recover? Well, okay, here's one of my more memorable ones and it was pretty, it was a doozy. Uh, we were having a lot of people come over for dinner. Now this is before even my YouTube channel started and I wasn't as experienced because I wasn't cooking as much. I mean, I had cooked, but when you're doing something like this and you're putting out sometimes three or four videos a week, which I did for over a year, you're cooking a lot. Well, on this one occasion, many years ago, people were gonna be over at four and I said, oh, we're gonna have brisket. So I said, the brisket's gonna be ready at four. Well, if you cook brisket, a lot of times you will recognize that the brisket will dictate the time it's done. And if you haven't done enough advanced planning to give yourself a good hold time at the end, yeah, you're gonna end up with tough brisket. So right around 3.30, when I checked the brisket, the internal temp was 185. Safe to eat, tough as a shoe. I think it was probably close to 188 when I ended up serving it. And uh, yeah, it was a, Let's just say it was a tasty, chewy shoe. And how did I recover from that? Well, I learned my lesson. Time plus temperature equals tenderness. You gotta follow those three things when you're doing those long cooks with large cuts of meat like pork butt and brisket. Patience, patience, patience. Definitely hope you're feeling better. Any update? Well, I'm sure what this is referencing is a video that I put out not that long ago, late last year, telling that I had a stroke. I was very fortunate I had probably the best kind of stroke you can have, which is called a TIA. It's often called a mini stroke, a transient ischemic attack. It's where there's a small blood clot that moves through your brain, temporarily blocking blood flow, and then it moves on. Uh, it was a pretty scary 20 minutes of my life, and then you know the next few days in the hospital as they checked and did tests, and I've had tests and tests and tests, and doctor's appointments, and neurologists, and everything, and. I'm doing well, I haven't had any residual effects from it. Uh, I consider myself very fortunate. If you haven't watched that video, I'm gonna link it up in the corner here and in the video description below because I think it's important to understand the signs of a stroke that you may be having because I was home alone and I had to make the decision to call 911 and I'm very glad I did. What's your go-to low-cost meal to feed the family? Well, at this point with what prices are, I would have to say pork loin. If you treat it right, it can be a great cut super juicy, super tender. You can put great flavor on it. You can make a sauce to go with it. So I find pork loin is really, really an economical cut to use. Why did you go with the Hunsaker Vortex over other barrel style smokers? Well, I did research and you know, the Hunsaker wasn't the cheapest and there were other ones that I think probably more people own. But what I really liked about the Hunsaker was the simplicity. The intake vent at the bottom is extremely simple to use. The floating hinge lid, so the lid stays attached. It comes with a wheel package already installed, and you can get it, you know, different colors. You can get it stainless steel if you want and pay more. Uh, I've just been really happy with it. It cooks great food. 
Uh, I've run that thing, I think, on a single load of charcoal for 12 hours now. That was one cook that I did for 12 hours, running at about two, between 225 and 250 once I got it dialed in. So it puts out good food, and for me, one of the reasons I choose a cooker is, do I think I'm gonna have fun cooking on it? And I do have fun cooking on that. If one has the option of the SNS Kettle Grill for $475 or the Weber Master Touch for $679, what is the better choice? Personally, between those two, I'd go with the SNS. As I've mentioned before in videos, I think the SNS Girls Kettle has nice features that the Weber should have. I just think that you know Weber has stayed the same for so long, and there are reasons for that. They have a good fan base. A lot of people love them. I love them but I think they could tweak things a bit and really sort of bring their kettles to the level that the SNS is at now with allowing sort of dialing in temperature better. There's things on the SNS Girls Kettle which really help that. I mean, we're also just talking about thermometer placement. So yeah, if you had to choose between those two at this point, I'd go with the SNS. Must need accessories for grilling and smoking. I get this question a lot and it's not just about all the different things you can have if you boil it down to, let's say the one thing, that if you didn't have that, grilling and smoking would be more difficult and you would also have more of a likelihood to turn out food that isn't done or to the tenderness and taste that you want. There's really only one thing that I recommend to everyone else and that is a good instant read thermometer. I use the Thermapen 1. The Thermapen 1 is a tank. I've dropped this thing many times. I own, I don't know how many of them, I've purchased probably six. Thermoworks has been a supporter of this channel and they've sent me Thermapens over the years and I keep telling them to stop because I like to support the companies that have helped me. So whenever they send me one, I give it away to someone, one of my relatives, and I'll buy one. And then there are other ones that they make that are very specialized, such as surface contact temperature Thermapens for reading the temperature of say a flat top grill. Not an IR one, they make those too, but where it actually touches that. They also make a combination thermopen which has both the probe and an IR temperature sensor so you can check surface temperature with that. So these things are built really well. I love them. I have a lot of Thermoworks products, but yeah, if you're looking for one thing which is really going to help your grilling game, thermopen 1. What advice would you give a small but growing barbecue YouTube channel? Last year I reached the point of being monetized, but I'd love some advice from someone who has your experience in following. I also get this question a lot from people who email me. And the thing that I say to every single one is upload more videos. Now that doesn't mean you're going to grow because you are uploading more videos. What it's gonna do is you are going to learn more by uploading more videos. You're gonna learn through the mistakes you make. You're gonna get faster at filming and at editing. You're gonna learn so many things just by doing it more. Now one of the reasons my channel really started to sort of grow was I committed for an entire year to put out four videos a week plus one live stream. So I was effectively doing five videos a week and I did that for a full year. Now along the way I've had some help from other YouTube channels. Russ at Smoky Ribs Barbecue gave me a really nice shout out early in my career which really helped my channel. But in terms of what you can do, make more videos, upload more videos, make more mistakes, learn more. You have been introducing us to more non-barbecue items cooking of late. What is your favorite non-barbecue item to pair with a barbecue item? That is an easy question, potato salad. I am a potato salad junkie. I will try potato salad wherever I go that has potato salad just to see where it ranks in the potato salads that I love. So yeah, with barbecue food, potato salad for me, that's number one. Now this last question is probably the question I get the most through emails, through messages, through comments and videos. Where do you get your wood in Orange County? Well, I'll tell you, the woodshed. It's in the city of Orange. They have everything. They are the nicest people. If you happen to live in the Southern California area and you need wood, they are the place to go. Now, when I did a video many years ago using olive wood in a cook, they actually told me at the woodshed that people were calling them and emailing them to order olive wood, that they were shipping it in different places across the country because I used it because you could get olive wood there. Olive wood isn't easy to get everywhere. So yeah, they are great people there. They have just about anything you'd want. Not only wood, but they have barbecues, they have smokers, they have rubs, sauces, really good people. And I'll link their information in the description below. Hypothetically, you're on death row, last meal. Well, I'm glad you said hypothetically. Well, let's see here. 
I would have to split it into two meals and I would eat both of them. First would be lasagna, the second would be just a really good burger. And here's what I'd put on it. I wouldn't overload it. I'd want a nice grilled burger patty, not a smash patty, nothing wrong with those, but I would like a nice grilled, maybe even smoked patty, some pepper jack cheese, and some bacon. That's it. No sauce, nothing else. Slap that between a good brioche bun. That's my last meal, along with lasagna. So yeah, I'm gonna be pretty full. Well, I think that's enough questions for today. I gotta move on to getting this pizza dough ready. If you have any other questions, remember you can follow me on Instagram, on Facebook. Uh, you can ask questions there. I answer questions for people there quite a bit. You can message me there. And thank you everybody for watching. I mean, 2023, I think is gonna be a great year. 2022 was a good year with an interesting happening near the end, but you know, I'm feeling great and we're gonna be making some great food this year. So thank you.